Hi, welcome to Astro 101, the sun and its neighbors. This is already class seven. In today's class, we're gonna be looking at one of the most challenging topics that we cover all semester. In fact, today's lecture and the one before us really are the kind of the hardest things to understand. I think we're gonna be able to do it um, if, we, if we pay attention. And while they're challenging, it's, they're also really cool. The fact that there's these things that we see in the world that we can actually understand. To introduce today's topic, I've got a special guest. Ah, Sophia. Hey, Doug. Good morning. Hey, guys. Whoa. So I'm here at Crescent Beach. It is one, or I guess just after two o'clock, and it is currently low tide. Oh, hello. So I'm here at Crescent Beach at about 7.30 a.m., and as you can see, it is currently high tide. So I guess uh, you'll be here later this afternoon. So you say. Alrighty then. Bye, guys. All right. Well, I gotta go. Um, bye. Oh, bye, Sophia. All right, that's very cool. Um, Sophia left us with this really interesting video of um, Crescent Beach at low tide and at high tide. At low tide, you can see the water is way out there and all this is basically dry, whereas at high tide, the water's come in and this is all flooded. In fact, in Crescent Beach, um, the water levels rise by um, a couple of meters. And so the water level comes from out there all the way in. And we can see this difference between high tide and low tide. And we, you can look up online these tables that tell you when it's going to be high tide, when it's going to be low tide. But it took a very long time to figure out what is it that causes this phenomena where the water level is way out here at low tide, way in here, just half a, half a day later, um, at, or quarter day later, six, six hours later, at high tide. Um, Galileo, who we've talked about before, thought he had an, under, an explanation. He thought it was because of the motion, motion of the Earth as the moon moved around the Earth would cause the oceans to slosh around. And he was convinced this is a great evidence for the fact that the moon orbited the Earth. Um, no, that's not the case. That is not what causes tides. Today, we're going to find out. Let's, but t before we do that, we need to go and go ahead and review what we covered last class. That was a long class, lots of difficult ideas. Let's review them again just to make sure we, we see what's going on. It's to start with Newton's first law. Now, Newton's first law says, if we recollect, an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. In other words, if something is moving, it stays moving in the same direction at the same speed unless you apply a force to it. That's Newton's first law. So in the picture here, we have the figure skater and he is sliding along the ice in his very low friction skates. And he will just keep on moving, not speeding up, not slowing down, unless a, a force is applied to him. Newton's first law, if it's moving, it stays moving. If it changes direction or speed, it's because there is a force applied to it. Which brings us to Newton's second law. Newton's second law says something accelerates or something changes speed if there's a force applied to it. The larger the force, the more quickly the speed changes. He, Newton's second law also says that the heavier something is, the less quickly it accelerates. So we have the picture here of the little boy pushing grandma, small force, um, relatively large mass, therefore not a very quick acceleration. If you switch it around, put the boy in the cart and grandma pushes, then it'll accelerate quite quickly. So. More force, more acceleration, more mass, less acceleration, because in the equation here, the force is divided by the mass. So the bigger the mass, the less the acceleration. Nothing accelerates unless you apply a force. Okay. Excellent. Newton's second law. So we looked at some examples of that. Um, you know, this example here is something is pushing something. So you can imagine, um, you know, the engine in your car turning the wheels and making the car speed up. Speeding up is a form of acceleration, but remember also changing direction is a form of acceleration. Remember velocity is speed and direction combined together into one thing. Acceleration is change in velocity. So a change in the speed or the change in direction or both, which brought us to this little demo here where my beautiful wife spins uh, a ball on a string over her head and the ball goes in a circle because the string is applying a force to the ball. The string 
causes the ball to accelerate into a circle. And so we see the here, the string is applying a force to the ball, but then when she lets go of the string, the string no longer applying a force, the ball just travels in a straight line into the trees. Kerfump. Okay. So, Newton's second law. A force causes acceleration. The speed and the direction never change unless you apply a force. If you apply a force, then the speed or the direction can change. With no force, it'll travel in a straight line, neither speeding up nor slowing down. Okay, so Newton's third law. For every force, there is always an equal, equal and opposite reaction force. So if you push on something, it pushes back. We talked about the astronaut out in space who pushes against her spacecraft. She moves away from the spacecraft, but at the same time, the spacecraft moves away from her. Because she is lighter, she moves faster. Because the spacecraft is heavier, it moves slower. But every time you push something on something, it pushes back. To every force, there was always an equal and opposite reaction force. Newton's third law. So we took these three laws and we tried to understand from them how we can understand the behavior of objects in the solar system. So we looked at this. Um, I had this little story here. We have a, we launched a satellite at 33,000 kilometers per second from 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth to see what happens. And the answer is it goes out and it goes, it follows an elliptical orbit. The shape that it's following, it turns out, is an ellipse. And it speeds up when it gets close to the Earth and then slows down again as it gets further away. The center of the Earth is at one focus of the ellipse and there's another focus of the ellipse out here. Why is it an ellipse? That's a, a weird question. Let's, let's first try to understand how I did this simulation. What, what did I do to make the simulation work? Well, what I did is I took, first of all, Newton's law of gravitation, a force equals um, the mass of the first object, the Earth, times the mass of the second object, my satellite, divided by the distance squared times this little number g. And then we say, in this thing, so F is the force, M is the mass, there's mass of the first object, mass of the second object, R is the distance between them, between the center of the satellite and the center of the Earth, and A is the acceleration, the change in velocity. And then, so I take this law and I then add to it Newton's second law of motion, which says A, the change in velocity, is equal to the force divided by the mass the mass of the um, satellite. Now, something I want to, yeah, okay. Something I want to actually want to look at right now before we continue with this. Remember last class, I dropped the hammer and it accelerated downwards and accelerated downwards at 10 meters per second per second. And that I said that except for air resistance, anything you drop will accelerate that quickly. That's at first kind of a weird idea because you would say, well, look, the heavier the hammer is, the larger the force. So a larger force should make a bigger acceleration. Yes, but we're dividing it by the mass of the hammer. So a bigger mass of the hammer makes a smaller acceleration. And in fact, the mass in the force exactly cancels the mass in the acceleration. And so the acceleration does not depend on the mass of the object. That's kind of cool. That That's really actually, that's actually really neat. Well, there it is. Okay. So the fact that everything falls at the same speed, ignoring air spare friction, is a natural consequence of the force of gravity and Newton's second law. Okay. Anyway, going back to our orbit, we have the object. We see there's a force being applied on the object that equals g, the tiny number, times the mass of the Earth, times the mass of the satellite, divided by the distance between them, between the centers, squared. Okay. I calculate that, and then I say um, the speed will change by each time step. The speed will change by the force, sorry, the velocity, not the speed. The velocity will change by the force divided by the mass. So I can take my particle and I can say, okay, it's going in this direction. So each time step, I'll move it forward by however, however fast it's going, and then I will change the speed by whatever the acceleration is, and then go to the next time step and recalculate. So we have the force from gravity pulling it this way. We have the speed going that way. I move it forward in time to the next place. 
because it's going this direction, I move it this direction, and then I change the speed by, by this equation, change the velocity by this equation, not to speed, and then, and, then, and then step on. So let's see how this goes. We go into the future. Later on, we have the force now is in this direction, again, toward the center of the Earth. The speed is in this direction. I know what to do. I know how to, I know how to step it forward. I know how to change the speed, the velocity. I know how to change the acceleration, and I keep stepping forward. At this point, you see that the, the force has a component going this way to try and make it curve, but also a component in this direction. It's not pointing exactly sideways anymore. It's a little bit back. The force is also is, is causing the satellite to change direction and to slow down. If we go even later, if we go out here, the force is pulling this way. It's causing the, the satellite to slow down. The force is pulling toward the Earth and also causing it to change direction. And because it's so much further away, the force is much less. So the further away you are, the less the force, the less the acceleration. But to get out there, gravity had to be slowing it down. So when it gets out here, it's going much slower because gravity has been slowing it down the whole way. And now gravity will cause it to speed up again until it finally gets in close to the Earth. So this is how my little program works that uses Newton's second law and Newton's law of gravitation to make those orbits that I showed you. And uh, I mean, it's a really, really simple uh, differential equation solver, relatively speaking. There's much, much better ones, but this worked, a little Python program. Um, I mean, I'd love to teach you differential calculus right now, uh, uh, vector calculus rather, uh, but teaching you vector calculus probably out of scope of um, Astro 101. But this kind of math I'm talking about, Newton had to invent it in order to do this kind of work. So it's it's pretty pretty great. Um, now that we know it, it's like, oh yeah, that's kind of easy-ish. I don't know. All right, so orbits. You take these two equations, you apply them step by step by step, and you can reproduce the orbit of a satellite around the Earth. You find that it is an ellipse. You find that the Earth is at, the cent is at one of the focuses and that the other focus is somewhere in space. This nowhere here in this math that goes into this orbit, do we say anything about it being an ellipse? Nowhere in this math do we say anything about where the focuses are. It just, that's just how it works. So why isn't it an ellipse? Because it's a natural consequence of um, acceleration being proportional to the square of the distance from the mass. Very, it's very interesting. Uh, it, it's just, that's just the way it works. It's a natural consequence of these rules. Where did these rules come from? Well, there they are. They came from the mind of God. Okay, instant review quiz. When in the highly eccentric orbit of a comet is the speed of the comet the greatest? The speed, not the velocity, the speed. When is the speed the greatest? Four possibilities here. A, it's always, the speed is always the same. B, when the comet is furthest from the sun. C, when the comet is approaching the sun, coming in toward the sun. D, when the comet is closest to the sun. Or E, when the comet is moving away from the sun. When is the speed of the comet the greatest? Okay, we can think back to this. This is actually, this is Kepler's second law, isn't it? When is the speed the greatest? Do you remember? D, when the comet is closest to the sun, that's when the speed is greatest. Okay. Next question. When, in the highly eccentric orbit of a comet, is the angular momentum of the comet the greatest? Remember going back to last class, the idea of angular momentum? When is the angular momentum of the comet the greatest? Option A, it's always the same, because angular momentum is conserved. Or B, when the comet is furthest from the sun, when the comet is approaching the sun, when the comet is closest to the sun, or when the comet is moving away from the sun? Well, the answer is A, right? Angular momentum is conserved. It's always the same. So A. Good. That one is easy. easy. All right. Next question. When in the highly eccentric orbit of a comet is the force due to gravity 
between the comet and the sun the greatest? When is the force due to gravity between the comet and the sun the greatest? Well, it's the universal law of gravitation, so the force is always the same. Or, when the comet is furthest from the sun. Or, when the comet is approaching the sun. Or, when the comet is moving away from the sun. Or, when the comet is closest to the sun. What do you think? When is the force of gravity between the comet and the sun the greatest? Let's remind, remind ourselves about the equation. Force equals g. Then it's got the two masses multiplied, divided by the distance squared. So the masses aren't changing in this in this problem, right? The masses are always the same, and g is always the same, but the distance is changing, because it's a highly eccentric orbit. It's going from close to far. You divide the force by the distance squared. So a bigger distance is a smaller force. So a smaller distance is a larger force. The answer, the force must be greatest when the comet is closest. So it must be d. When the so when the objects are close together, there's a large force. When they're further apart, it's a small force. So when the comet is closest to the sun is when the force is greatest. Which leads us to our last little instant review quiz question. When, in the highly eccentric orbit of a comet, is the comet's acceleration the greatest? I mean, the same things here. Furthest, approaching, closest, moving away. Or both B and D. So is it when it's furthest away? When it's coming toward it? It's kind of falling in toward the sun, or when it's kind of scooting, moving out away from the sun, maybe the acceleration would be like slowing down the quickest, or when it's closest, when it's spinning around. With, that's especially when it's closest, we know it's moving the fastest, but where is the acceleration the greatest? Well, there's a few ways we can think about this. One way is we can remember the last question, which said that the force is the greatest when it's close. And then remember Newton's second law that says the acceleration depends on the force. The bigger the force, the bigger acceleration. That would say that the biggest acceleration is when the force is the biggest. And that would say that it is when the comet is closest to the sun. Now, it's interesting. When the comet is closest to the sun, that's when it's moving the fastest, but it's also, it's kind of when the speed is changing the least. The speed is not changing when it's closest to the sun. But the direction is changing very rapidly. And remember, acceleration is a change in velocity. In other words, a change in speed or direction. And so the force of gravity is the strongest when it's closest to the sun. Therefore, the acceleration is largest when it's closest to the sun. And what's happening there is the direction is changing rapidly when it's close to the sun. So the answer there is C. All right, are we starting to understand how Newton's laws cause orbits? You have the object moving, you have the force of gravity pulling on it, changing its direction, and it just moves along. And as it moves, the force is continuously trying to change the direction. And the faster, the, the further away it is, the less the force. The closer it is, the greater the force. As it moves away, there's force pulling it back, so it slows down when it's, when it's coming toward it. The force is accelerating it forward and continuing to cause it to curve. So in the end, you end up with an ellipse. Why is it an ellipse and not some other shape? Because the answer is an ellipse. OK, there we go. Moving on. The next thing we talked about was free fall. Remember this question? We have our astronaut floating in space. And we ask, why is the astronaut floating and not falling to the Earth? Remember, there's still the force of gravity acting on him. In fact, he's only about 5% lighter than he would be on the surface. So 5% less force of gravity, therefore 5% less weight, not mass, but weight. So why is he floating and not falling to the Earth? The answer is because he is in orbit, like his spacecraft. The thing we just talked about, he is moving forward. Gravity is pulling him toward the Earth. And so he's turning, but he's going fast enough that he never hits the Earth. He just keeps curving around it, like the spacecraft in our little calculation we did. So he is orbiting at the same speed as the spacecraft. So he feels 
weightless. He feels that he's just responding to whatever gravity wants him to do. So he feels like he has no weight. He is in orbit like his spacecraft. He's traveling at around 26,000 kilometers per hour in this case. So the force required to make him go in a circle is the same as the force of gravity. Pretty cool. All right. Free fall. Whenever the only thing acting on you is the force of gravity, then we say you are in free fall. It feels like you're falling. Even though he's not going toward the center of the earth, he, the only thing acting on him is gravity. Therefore, he feels weightless. I can explain this slightly a, a different way a bit. If, if you, have you ever been to the amusement park and gone those spinny rides and they push you back against the, uh, the wall? that pushing back, it feels just like gravity. Now imagine you're on a spinny thing, but you're spinning at just the right rate so that the force of spinning, of being turned into a circle, equals the force of gravity and they exactly cancel. Then you would feel weightless. That's what's happening to him. He's going around the earth at 26,000 kilometers per hour. The force of gravity pulling him down exactly equals the force required to make him go in a circle. And therefore, he is weightless and he's going in a circle. That's pretty cool. All right, free fall. Now on to our new topic for the day. We're going to take these same ideas we've been talking about, about force, and apply them to trying to understand where the heck tides come from. So let's start here. Here we have the Earth looking down at the North Pole. Here we have the Moon looking down at the North Pole of the Moon. We have the force of gravity. Force equals g m1 m2 over r squared. m1 is the mass of the Earth. m2 is the mass of um, the Moon. r is the distance between the centers of the planets. That's the force on the whole of the Earth acting on the whole of the Moon. But what if I say I don't want to talk about... Yeah, so the gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon applies a force. Okay. But what if I don't want to talk about just the force of gravity on the center of the Earth? Let's imagine I think about, you know, uh, a bit of rock here on the edge. Um, just on this side of the Earth, I'm just going to imagine just a little mini sphere of rock. Right? It's part of the Earth, but I'm going to say, what's the force of gravity on that rock from the Moon? Well, it's closer. So a given chunk of rock will have a larger force than a chunk at the same mass at the center of the Earth from the Moon, because it's closer. So here it's closer, there's a larger force applied to a chunk of rock here than a chunk of rock there, if the chunk of rock is the same size. The fact that the rocks are all connected together doesn't really matter, right? We're saying, what's the force of gravity on this bit of the Earth? The force of gravity in this bit of the Earth is stronger than the force of gravity on this bit of the Earth, because it's closer to the Moon. The force of gravity from the Moon on this chunk of rock is larger and the force of gravity from this chunk of rock, which will cause that chunk of rock to be pulled this way compared to the center. Well, how about back here? What about a chunk of rock out here a long way further from the moon? Well, it's further away, so there will be a smaller force applied to a chunk of rock further from the moon. Huh. So the force of gravity from the moon is less here than here, and greater here than here. So what's that going to do? Well, this is pulling away from here, and this is pulling away from here. So it's going to take the entire Earth and stretch it in the direction of the Moon, right? This is pulling harder than here, so this pulls away from here. So at this, this point stretches away from this point, and then this point stretches away from that point. So this stretches away from there, and this stretches away from there. So the whole Earth gets squished up. Now, the Earth is going to move due to the average force on the whole Earth, unless the Earth breaks. But if the Earth doesn't break, then all that's going to happen is the Earth is going to get stretched. And the same thing will happen to the Moon. Now, this, of course, doesn't happen right away, right? Um, turns out that uh, rock and the Earth's mantle this thing, stuff the Earth is made of, doesn't bend very quickly. It kind of, you push a force and it goes, bleh, bleh. okay? So this bending into a blob like this doesn't happen right away. It takes time before it bends to its natural shape. So what do we do with this? Well, 
the Earth is rotating, and it's rotating too quickly for the rock and the mantle to really respond much. So here's the Earth spinning around. It's trying to squish out like this toward the, Earth, toward the Moon because of this differential force. But by the time it starts to move, the Earth is rotated, and it tries to move a different way, and it's rotated and it's trying to move a different way. So you end up with the shape of the Earth barely changing. That's rock and the mantle. But what if, instead, the whole Earth were covered in a large ocean? Well, if the whole Earth was covered in a large ocean, well, the ocean would move. The ocean would stretch out compared to the moon. They'd have time to, the ocean would have time to flow. They'd respond. So what we find is that, in fact, the oceans on Earth do respond to the tidal forces from the moon. So the oceans do squeeze out, and it gets, the oceans are thicker on this side. Oceans are thicker toward the moon, or just oceans are thicker away from the moon, and they're thinner um, in this direction because of the force from the moon. Now, something funny about this picture you'll notice, I drew it, I drew it tipped. That's because the Earth is turning, and friction with the rotating Earth causes the tidal bulge to lag behind. So it's not quite lined up with the moon, it's lagging behind a bit just because of friction between the Earth and the oceans. So the Earth is turning, the oceans are responding to the force from the moon, but because it's turning, it, it lags. So you get, you get these tidal bulges lagging behind um, the, the direction pointing at the moon. If you notice, there's a, there's a tidal bulge back here and a tidal bulge up here. Remember, this part is being pulled away from this part, this part's being pulled away from this part. So the whole Earth gets stretched. You don't just get a blob on the side facing the moon, you get a bulge on the side away from the moon because of this differential force where the back pulls not as hard as the middle, pulls not as hard as the front. So the whole thing gets stretched out. Now, I'm saying it with words. You may think I don't really get that. That's okay. The only way to really understand it, I think, is to do the proper math, do the proper integrations, which we're not going to do because we're not doing math in this class. So I kind of tried to explain to you how this squeezing action works. To really understand it, you have to do the math. So all you need to know, all you need to know is that there's a bulge on both sides of the Earth because of the moon. On the side facing the Earth, moon, and the side away from the moon, and that the, um, the bulge lags because of the spinning of the Earth. Those are the things you need to know. Exactly why it is, it comes from the force of gravity, it comes from Newton's laws, it comes from models of friction, but, um, and inertia, and viscosity, but, uh, those are much more complicated topics because you actually need to do the math to really understand them. So just kind of get the basic idea. You can think about it. All right. I kind of get it. That's, that's good enough. Okay. That's, I guess that's good enough. So this leg applies a force on the earth, causing its rotation to slow down. There's a, there's a force being applied because the thing is turning. The moon is pulling on it and then it's kind of dragging against it. So that dragging forms a force that actually is trying to slow the Earth's rotation down. I mean, it's a huge effect. In fact, when the Earth was first formed, the rotation period was only 14 hours. A day was 14 hours long when the Earth was for first formed. But now, billions of years later, because of this force from the moon continuously applying a force on the rotation of the Earth, the Earth has slowed down to the point where a day is now 24 hours. That's cool. What that means is that the rotation of the Earth is getting slower and will continue to get slower and slower and slower. And if the sun wasn't going to blow the Earth up in a few billion years, in billions of years, the Earth's rotation would finally stop and the Earth would always be, the same side of the Earth would always be facing the moon in the same way that the same side of the moon is always facing the Earth. In fact, that's what happened to the moon. Now, the Earth is much more massive than the moon. The force of gravity, the, the tidal forces on the moon are much larger than the tidal forces um, on the Earth from the moon. The tidal forces from the Earth on the moon are much larger than tidal forces of the moon on the Earth. And the moon is much smaller, much lighter, much easier to speed up and slow down. Consequently, the rotation of the moon has stopped relative to the Earth. It is now tidally locked. 
so that the same side of the Earth always faces, same side of the Moon always faces the Earth. It does, it no longer spins relative to the Earth. That's because of this tidal effect. The force, the tidal forces causing the Moon to be elongated for it to turn would require that rock to be continuously being squeezed and unsqueezed. And that takes energy that pro produces friction and it would, it slowed down the rotation of the moon until finally the same side of the moon always faces the earth. Tidal locking. So that, oh, there was this mystery we had. Why is the rotation of the moon exactly right? So the same size of the moon faces the earth. It's because of this tidal force. And the same effect that's, ha that made the earth do that is making, uh, made the moon do that is slowly making the earth do that. Oh, that's, well, that's cool. Well, there it is. Now we know. Same side of the moon always faces the earth because of tidal forces. Cool. All right. Review, instant review quiz. In this model that I showed you, how many tides are there in a day? Is there one tide when you're facing the moon? Or is there one tide, one high tide, um, a little after you're facing the moon because of that leg? Or is there two, one when you're facing the moon and one on the opposite side because there's two bulges? Or is it D2, a little after you're facing the moon because of the leg and then around 12 hours later? Well, it's D, right? There's, there's two tides, there's two high tides. There's the one sort of facing the moon and the one sort of facing opposite the moon, but they are um, lagged from each other because of um, that friction effect, the same effect that's slowing down the Earth so it, it, the day gets longer and longer, and which caused the moon to stop uh, rotating relative to the Earth. All right, there you go. It's a review quiz complete. Okay, so the idea called tidal locking, friction with the rotating Earth causes the tidal bulge to lag behind. This leg applies a force on the Earth, causing its rotation to slow down. Rotation period was at 14 hours. Okay, we already did all this. It's weird. Now, okay, well, it turns out you might be asking yourself, well, doesn't the sun also provide a gravitational force on the Earth? After all, the Earth is orbiting around the sun. Surely, the sun must provide a gravitational force on the Earth, and therefore, the sun presumably would cause tides on the Earth. And the answer is yes, it does. The sun also causes tidal forces on the Earth. The sun is much more massive, so you'd think, well, maybe it's going to provide larger tidal forces, but it's much further away, so maybe you'd conclude that it provides much smaller tidal forces. It turns out that um, the further away component overwhelms the larger mass of the sun component. So it ends up that the tides from the sun are smaller than the tides from the moon, but in the same kind of order. When the, the earth, when the moon, the earth, and the sun in that direction are all lined up. In other words, when you're on a full moon or a new moon, because it can be over here or over there, when you're all lined up in a full moon or a new moon, the tidal forces from the moon and the tidal forces from the, oh, I should say sun, tidal forces from the moon and from the sun add together. This is called a spring tide. And in full moon and a new moon, the tidal forces from the moon and the earth add together, you get a spring tide. When the, on a quarter moon, when the sun is down here, down below, looking up this way. In a quarter moon, the tidal forces from the sun partially cancel the tidal forces from the moon. This is called a neap tide. It's a smaller tide. So the sun is trying to make tidal bulges aligned this way, but lagged because of the rotation of the earth. The moon is trying to make tidal bulges aligned this way. The moon beats the sun, but the sun makes the tides smaller. So you get small tides, during a quarter moon, and you get large tides during a full moon. That's the theory anyway. Let's see what you actually get. Here we have tide tables 
for Tofino, British Columbia. So this is on the um, west coast of Vancouver Island. So you're just right on the edge of the Pacific Ocean. And what you find is that near a new moon, full moon or near a new moon, you get large tides. During the quarter moon, you get smaller tides. You also see you get two tides per day. One, so you get one high tide in the daytime here, and one high tide at night, day, night, day, night, all along. That's pretty cool. Um, just like we said it should be. So this really does appear to be the explanation for tides. Now, there's some weird things going on slightly. It turns out that this model we just gave, gives, gives the tidal levels for the kind of the whole Earth. But when you have water flowing up and down channels and up and down inlets and, and things, that flow kind of messes up this easy calculation because it get even more lag and more weird delays. So if you look at a tide table for somewhere that's more inland, maybe up a inlet or something, you won't get this nice double bumps like this. It'll look a little bit different. That's just because the water takes time to flow and it kind of bounces around a bit. It's much more complicated to calculate. But this, this, this story really does apply to the rising and lowering of the ocean as a whole. When you have a full moon or a new moon, you get large tides. When you have a quarter moon, you get smaller tides. That's because the tides from the um, sun cancel out the tides from the uh, moon to some level. All right, so we're almost done here. Finally, we can go ahead and look at this plot, we, this, this simulation we saw last class. Now remember this last class? We were looking at how um, Charon is orbiting around Pluto, but not around the center of Pluto. It's orbiting around a spot kind of in between Pluto and Charon because um, the mass of Charon is kind of almost large compared to the mass of Pluto. So it actually orbits around this spot right there. We also noticed that the same side of Charon always, all, same side of Pluto always faces Charon, and the same side of Charon always faces Pluto. Before, we didn't really understand why that is, but now we do. It's this tidal locking. If Charon were to be rotating compared to Pluto, that squeezing of the shape of Charon due to Pluto would be significant. And it would, it would be trying to make this oblong shape. And as it turned, it would be have to like break the rock and bend it. And that would take energy. That Presumably, it was happening at one point in the, in the life of Pluto and Charon, but that rotating gradually slowed down Charon's rotation until finally the same side always faces Pluto, and exactly the same thing. Pluto, the Charon, trying to bend Pluto. Pluto originally was probably rotating compared to Charon, but then finally, because of millions and billions of years of this rotation, it just dissipated the energy until finally it rolled to a stop. So the same side of Charon always faces same side of Pluto always faces Charon. The same side of Charon always faces Pluto. So in the last two classes, we've looked at how Newton's laws can be used to describe the behavior of many, many things in the universe, from falling hammer hammers to the orbit of Charon around Pluto. We can use it to understand um, tides. We can understand use it to understand why the same face of the moon is always facing the Earth. And this was the start of a huge revolution in science where people began to believe that we could really understand the behavior of anything in the universe. And Newton's laws of motion and later physics from them have became incredibly successful in understanding a huge wide range of phenomena. And by the 19th century, electromagnetism, the laws of electromagnetism came along, the laws of understanding how light behaved. And we kind of came to a point where the assumption was that we really understand the behavior of everything. Now, there's a limit to this, right? We don't know why F equals MA. We don't know why the acceleration is proportional to the force divided by the mass. We don't know why the acceleration of a particle is inversely proportional to the distance um, from a massive object. I mean, we can say things, but why is it that way instead of some other way? We don't really know, but we know that if that is how the universe behaves, and it does, then we can predict the behavior of a great many, many things. Now, by the end of the 19th century, there were very few things missing. Very few experiments that didn't quite match the data. One of them was that the orbit of Mercury disagreed with Newton's laws. That is to say, Mercury's orbit 
was off just by this tiny little bit. You're like, well, that's small. It is small. But there's no particular reason why Newton's laws shouldn't be perfect. Lots of explanations. Maybe there's another planet. Maybe the sun isn't perfectly spherical. But none of these could be made to fit the data. Until finally, um, in the early 20th century, another extraordinarily famous physicist, Albert Einstein, proposed his theory of general relativity, which supplants Newton's laws of motion. And Newton's, sorry, Einstein's view of the universe is very different than the view of the universe described in Newtonian mechanics. Space-time is actually bent by mass. It's not a force, it's a warping of space-time. And so he would say, the reason that the orbit of Mercury was off is because, in fact, space near the Sun is bent, and the distance is a little bit larger than he thought it was. Crazy, weird ideas. But if you take Einstein's description of the way the universe works, all of a sudden, all these errors go away. And then it predicted other things. It predicted gravitational waves being emitted by spinning objects. It predicted the existence of black holes, places where gravity is so strong that light can't even get out. And in fact, as you get close to the black hole, time itself slows down. These crazy, crazy objects. Objects which have been confirmed. Predictions that have been shown to be true. So, we now would say Newton's laws of motion, well, they're not, they're not right. They're, they're wrong. They're wrong in that they don't always predict the behavior the universe will, will, will experience. They usually do, except for in really weird places where the gravitational forces are enormous, like near the sun or near a black hole. Will we then go and say that Newton was wrong or that his theories were of no value? No. No, they're still very, very useful. If you want to calculate what happens when you kick a football, Newton's laws are great. You do not want to mess around with Einstein, the Einstein equations because they are so unbelievably complicated to use. But we also would say that it's an incomplete theory. This is how things work in, in physics. We come up with a description of the behavior of the universe. We do experiments to test the description until we find a discrepancy. And then we look for a modification to the theory or a whole new way of looking at it that will explain this discrepancy. And so that we can, again, say we have a model that fits all the observations. We are now back into a place like we were in the 19th century, where to a pretty impressive level, there isn't an experiment we can think of where we could not, at least in principle, calculate what the outcome of the experiment would be. There's a small number of, of ex exceptions. We don't know how to describe the extremely, extremely early universe. The, the first tiny fraction of a second when the temperatures and densities were high enough, we don't think we know how to calculate what happens there. There's this mysterious thing in the universe we call dark energy, which causes causing the universe's expansion to speed up. We don't really know what causes that, where it's from, what it's doing. But there are very, very few areas we just don't know how to calculate them. It's We're hopeful that it is in searching out those unexplained areas that hopefully we can come up to a new understanding of how the universe works, science continues. Um, we've been able to accomplish a lot, but we, we, we aren't done. Looking forward to the next class when we'll start looking at the sun and at light. Thank you very much.